Well, thanks, everyone. I want to take you on a journey, a journey of the mind that begins right here, because I have a big confession to make. My name is Jim Garvin, and I live in space. It's really embarrassing to confront that, but that's the reality of it. So today, I want to take you on a voyage, not to the final frontier, but to the forever frontier, because that's what space is for all of us. It's not a four-letter word. Space is the word about what's all around us. So I'm going to take a voyage that starts in the past, what we've done, continues to the present, what we're doing, and leaves open that future for what could be. The first 55 years of space exploration has been a grand ride, but the next 55 will be even better. Let's go to the videotape. Now, one thing that's important to think about as we think about space is how would Mark Twain have seen space? And I like to think of what the great writer would have said. He would have said, if I had more time, I would have made it smaller. But space is huge. It's massive. It's taken the greatest engineering feats of the last 50 years to get us there. And when we think about space sometimes, we think about stars and galaxies, planets, all the things we know and love. In fact, most of the space that we're learning about today is unseen, unmeasured. It's captured in videos like this that artists put together, the dark matter and the dark energy that we have yet to probe. The beauty of the space we see are little tiny straw lines of what it really is doing. Voyages of the Hubble, the Spitzer and the Kepler show us the majesty of the physics of space. But I like to tell the kids, physics is fun and there's a lot more physics to do. And what we see today is just what our mind's eye can see. The new space we're about to embark upon will involve discovering things that we didn't know about 20 years ago. Because it is such a changing forever frontier. The galaxies, the stars, the suns, the planets of our solar system will expand. And the first thing I like to tell you about is space is dynamic. It's a collisional universe. Cosmic collisions have shaped our planet, who we are, and why we should care. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould once said to many of us, if you played the tape backwards, we would not be here. So our Earth is a dynamic place, you can see from the video. Today we study it from a constellation of satellites that show us how it's changing. Some of the changes we've detected in space were not even understood until we got to space. We've only been there for about 40 years to see the changing ice scapes, the snow scapes, the temperature, how hurricanes form. We've only had about 40 years to look at that for our planet. There's so much more to do. The unmeasured Earth is our point of departure into deeper space. So as we look at our pale blue dot, our blue marble, let's think of what it's really, gonna, really what's going to happen. In the next three or four billion years, our planet will change from the blue marble to the brown marble. This is inevitable. Comparative planetology has shown us our sun will wither. It will die. Earth will become a planet without water. So as we think about that, we know what's coming. It's what's coming in the near term that's within our destiny and our control. The long-distant Earth tells us single planet species don't survive. So the first challenge with space historically was getting there. We had to take the greatest feats of engineering of the 20th century to lift the stuff, the masses it took, to put people on the moon. It's been said, perhaps, that we went to the moon 50 years ahead of our time. Perhaps Magellan did the same in circumnavigating the Earth, although he didn't come back, um, back in the 16th century. You can decide. But we went to space on the shoulders of giant rockets, giant engineering, majestic engineering. We did the impossible. We moved rooms as big as this into space. And then we built a reusable space rocket plane with the chutzpah of saying we can do this. And we really did. And 131 flights later, we built an outpost on the edge of space, the International Space Station, where today, six humans, just like us, hominids, carbon-based life forms, live and work on space. But what did we learn? One thing we learned is that in going to space, what we do is catalytic. These are images of the landing in, in November of 1969 of Apollo 12. I show you this because what we did then was navigate to the moon within 100 yards of where we had landed before. We demonstrate a capability that today was the seed corn of the GPS you used to get for where we are. The other thing we do now is, as we look forward, we dare to hope for what could be. And we have options. One option is to return to the moon. The moon's a big place, a land area the size of Africa sending people back to the moon with machines could be that ennobling stepping stone to the bigger universe out there. And that's one option. 
We've looked at that under past presidential viewpoints. The other thing we've done is we've looked at our nearby planets. The Earth is a beautiful place. Our sister planet Venus is too. And yet we barely touched her surface. This planet is beckoning and telling us in a beguiling way, come listen to me. I'm your lost sister. How many of us have a lost sister? I don't know. Think about it. But Venus is a, is a profoundly unique place with a giant hostile atmosphere, an atmosphere we have not probed, a surface we think that is volcanically resurfaced, a world that may have lost its oceans, a planet with climate change run amok, and yet we haven't been back in 25 years. The United States has never landed on the surface of Venus. The only landings were achieved in the 70s and 80s by the Soviet Union. Here's our sister planet, eight light minutes away. And then there's Mars, our brother planet. A world like Earth, yes, it looks like a dirty brown snowball, but in fact, it's a water world. We've discovered that over the last 25 years. This world is calling our name. Come hither, come hither. And so we have come. And the voyages of our remote sensing missions over the last 16 years have shown us Mars, Mars in a majestic landscape. What we see are gigantic canyons, volcanoes, ice sheets, a record of water buried in the rocks. Our Grand Canyon would fit in the smallest side canyon here on Mars. Why does this little planet do it that way? Well, we're there to find out. 12 years ago, we dared the audacity of Mars to say we would go to Mars with a surface mobile laboratory known as Curiosity to plumb the chemistry of what Mars is trying to tell us at the rocks. I told one of my colleagues here, you know, in going to Mars, we read the record in the rocks because the rocks don't lie. I've never met a rock that lied to me, seriously. <laughs> So we went boldly, the engineers at our jet propulsion lab and across the country landed a one metric ton car-sized vehicle on Mars. Curiosity is driving today and showing us these vibrant rockscapes. And for me, this is Ansel Adams does the planets, you know. It's majestic, it's artistic. There's mountains there, folks. 12,000, 14,000 foot mountains. There's rocks. These rocks attest to the history, the flagstones we see of stream, streams of water. The history of water on Mars is recorded in the chemistry of these rocks, and we're seeing that today on Curiosity. Yes, these look like the flagstones we all have and know and love. So Mars is beckoning, and today, 270 days into this mag magical mission, we're drilling into the real Mars, collecting samples and analyzing them inside our laboratory. We don't have to bring them home. We can analyze them there. These little drill holes about the size of a dime have shown us that Mars contains chemistry about past environments that may have been habitable for the kinds of life we understand on Earth. That is a big change from the Mars of the 70s when we said polar, sterile, dead. So how do we do Mars next? Well, scientists say we have to go. We're really amazing explorers, we people. When you stick us somewhere, we figure it out. We're good engineers, we're good artists, we're good philosophers, and we're good scientists. Getting to Mars with people will be the supreme challenge because it is far. As Kennedy said, it's hard. It is really hard. And it's 1,500 to 2,000 times further away than the moon. That's a long trip. It's going to take new work, new technology, new thinking, catalytic technology that will feed back into our lives here on Earth to send women and men to Mars. And yet it will be bold. It will be like building a cathedral to the future. To get there, we're going to need new things, new techniques. One of the ideas we have now is to learn how to interact with small bodies in space, asteroids no bigger than a piece of this stage, that we could actually entrap, capture, visit, and return to close to Earth. Not to crash into Earth, no, wouldn't be prudent, but, sorry about that, but bring them back so we can learn to explore these objects which have left their signs on planet Earth. This kind of mission is one of the bold imagineerings that our space agency here is looking at. Imagine human beings going to this space rock close by, interacting and returning to Earth with these priceless samples of the universe, like we did of the moon so many years ago. So space is calling us. It's been a transformative frontier. Today, we are amidst an absolutely profound scientific revolution. We know we're not alone as planets now, folks. In the last 20 years, we've discovered thousands of planets around nearby suns and stars. We call these exoplanets, not endoplanets, not Oprah planets, exoplanets. They're around other stars. They have characteristics that we're starting to decipher using indirect forensic methods. We're doing CSI does the universe now in space every day. We're discovering some of them are Earth-like in some ways. We need to do more. 
The Kepler mission that we're now flying has discovered over 3,000 candidates in one little neck of this gigantic universe. It's going to take the energy and the creativity of technology, entertainment, science, engineering, to bring at light speed the signals from these worlds back. Because we want to go. We want to find the other pale blue dots, the blue marbles at Beckon, or maybe the orange Venuses that are out there. And yes, they're far. We measure their distances in light years. Many years ago, a, a, a program called Alien Planet, which appeared on Discovery Channel, produced by Evergreen Films, took a bunch of us scientists together and said, what would it be like to go to one of these stars? And we imagineered the future, going to a planet around a nearby star with adaptable autonomous robots that are almost like living things, like you'd see in Star Trek or Star Wars, visiting a world where we really won't know what it's like from our vantage point, but going there with aerobots laden with sensors that can adapt to the real worlds we're on to understand what other self-replicating biological processes might be like. And they may not be like ours. We have to get away from our terracentric view and think out of the box. And these artists who put together this program about six years ago tried to capture what could be. This is not what is. This is what we long to find out about. How are we not alone in this magical universe? Because the probabilities of us being alone are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And don't we want to find out? Don't we want to see the bigger universe Go touch it, taste it, and use it to build our future. So let's come home to Earth. This is where we live. This is where we make decisions. I'm going to fly you into one place where decisions are made, um, actually where I'm from, and, uh, and talk about how we people can affect the future. We live in space. Space affects us every second of every day, every minute. It controls our climate, influences our weather, our cell phones. It's not a joke. It's a story. It's where we live. And yes, decisions are made by our representative officials, and they're aware of the lure of space. So let's come back to it. Deep space, the dark matter and dark energy. It is not our job, folks, to foresee what it's going to be like in the next 55 years. I haven't a, haven't a clue. But it's our job, and we think we've done that, to enable that, to bring space closer to you, to learn to live off the land of space where our planet resides. Because we really are on a voyage. It's a profound voyage. Um, as we cruise on our little planet Earth spaceship through this forever frontier. Now, I'd like to close with a thought. How does space touch you every day, every second? Well, 50 years ago, at the dawn of the space age, we hadn't been anywhere. We hadn't launched into space. No human had ever gone. The robots were just beginning to think about it. And today, we look at literally hundreds, hundreds of voyages in space by our robotic colleagues. Well, not colleagues, robotic things we built. We have not sent a single nickel or dollar or dime or euro or ruble into space. We've sent our passions and our energies there. And it's calling us. It's calling us like the movies say. Listen, it's there. Just a couple months ago, we had a little collision with a, an object. You saw it on the, the dashboard phones in, of people living in Russia as they drove and saw across the morning sky a fireball near Chablinsk. And it did damage. This is a little piece of what space tells us. We need to understand the space we live in. To not do so would be like neglecting our neighborhood, whether it be here in Traverse City or across the whole world, across the nation. And our Earth is a changing place. Our spaceborne observations of Earth have shown us some of the changes that we never realized were occurring. Loss of ozone holes. We may have an ice-free Arctic. These are things that we've observed from the spaceborne platform. So the future now in space is yours to shape. It really is. We've built a platform, a foundation. We've gone. We're ready to go back. The machines are out there, beyond the heliopause, charting the heavens with Hubble, with Kepler, soon with an even bigger telescope that will image some of those exoplanets, the James Webb Telescope. The legacy of space is there for all of you. So I'll conclude with a, with a little personal story. Um, we all have our moments when we think about space. Sometimes early in the morning, you can look up and you can see the, the morning star Venus or a fireball going by, or a comet. When I was a youngster, I climbed onto the roof of my high school, I know, not prudent nowadays, probably illegal, to see a comet streak by. And I took my brother, who had no interest in space or science, with me. And we stood up there on a cold night in New England, and we watched a little fuzzball go by. And we thought, you know, as two kids, more probably interested in hockey and music than this stuff, you know, this is where it's at. This is the universe interacting with us. We're seeing it in action. 
we have a front row seat. And today, you have a front row seat. We're there in space. Lots of satellites, people on a space station. We're ready to go, ready to go back. We're ready to build the cathedral to the stars for the next generation. So our planet, our people survive. And I'll leave you with my final quote. It's been said, as people looked at the history of life on Earth, that, you know, single, uh, single species living on single islands don't survive. I would leave you with the thought that single planet species don't survive. Our destiny is to go into space. Thank you all.